All right, let's start from the beginning because that's where we usually start. Uh, this last summer, I was contacted by someone that we'll call Marcel because uh, that's his name. Uh, and I got contacted by Marcel to build a instrument. Now, not only just an instrument, but something kind of special. Uh, he is really passionate about something called the Sitka Music Festival. He actually lives in Sitka, Alaska. And um, he was interested in finding a luthier that would make an instrument with the local woods of their local forest. And so I thought that was a really exciting idea that they had. So I was totally on board. Um, like I said, this was last summer. And so uh, they sent me the woods a while back and I've had them acclimating uh, to my shop to a point to where now I'm actually gonna rough cut them to size and let them finish the last little bit of drying at scale versus trying to dry a whole board. Now, all this stuff is dried naturally. Uh, I'm nervous to kiln dry this stuff to lose the tone as well as to shock the wood. It's been through a lot. Um, but it's a whole bunch of different species um, that I'll be using. And so this should be a really, really interesting build. I'll be doing some stuff that I usually don't show, like I'll be making a fingerboard from scratch, um, tailpiece from scratch, all this stuff for this violin. Now, oh, did I mention this violin? I don't know. It's a violin um, with the hopes of doing in the future a viola and a cello, um, all made from this local wood. Now, uh, it's gonna be a fun build. Um, I, like I said, I'm really excited about it, but you'll see some differences if you've watched any of the other videos. Um, one, you can tell I'm down in a different shop. I'm down in uh, the Georgetown College Sculpture Lab uh, because of this weird noise thing in my studio. And so what I'm gonna do a little differently this, this time is you might hear me narrating more. Uh, so you'll need to see me doing some handwork and doing some narration. So uh, let's get started on the Sitka violin. All right, so before we get too deep into things, let me talk about some of the wood species that I'm using in this build. Now, this violin will also look quite different than most violins. I am not gonna tone or change the wood color of these species because I want it to be a representation of that area and an authentic kind of color of the woods that are up there in Sitka, Alaska. I do not in any way kind of want to disrespect the woods by varnishing them in a dark color or staining them or anything else. So they will be almost exclusively natural. Uh, but I mean almost exclusively natural is I will be oiling them in a non-drying oil uh, to get the color that I look for. And then in the finishing of it, I'll be using a spirit varnish or a, um, a French polish, like a shellac, that I may tone naturally. Uh, so I won't be adding any kind of dyes or pigments or things. All that said, here are some of the species that I'll be using. Um, I'll be using some really, really lovely red cedar uh, for the inside, for actually for uh, the blocking on the inside, which is normally where you'll use other woods. Uh, but this one is very light um, and it's going to be really, really beautiful and nice to work with. Uh, for the sea bounce, so the edges of the ribs, on the inside of the ribs, I'll be using this lovely crab apple. Got these pieces right here. Uh, it's nice and dense. I think it's going to bend fun, <laughs> or be fun to bend, uh, but we'll make sure that works out well. Uh, for the other ribs, for this. For the upper and lower bouts, I'll be using yellow cedar. Um, this stuff is lovely, it's beautiful. Um, it's gonna look great and sound great. Uh, let me get through some of these. I have some Western hemlock. Now the hemlock here, you could actually use it for a top, um, but what I'm actually gonna use this for is for the base bar inside, the sound post inside, and a couple other components inside the violin. Um, this will resonate well. It has amazing growth rings, like, good golly. I'll see if I can get a zoom in of this uh, piece right here, but it is, I mean, a hundred of the inch almost. It is so dense. So anyways, so I'm gonna use that for, for a few of the sound-based elements inside the violin. So I'll show you a zoom in of this real quick. There you go, I don't know if you guys can see those growth rings there. They are super, super tight. Right, so this is actually on the quarter sawn. So what you're looking at right here, those are the growth rings. Pretty amazing. So now, this is what I'm use for the sound components inside. Let's look at the neck next. All right, so one of the components you always look at on a violin is not just the top, 
which we're going to talk about, not just the back or the ribs, you look at it all, but the neck uh, oftentimes has some figure to it or some unique kind of characteristics to it. I have this lovely block of uh, mountain ash that I'm going to be using for the neck. It has some lovely, lovely curl through it um, that you'll see in the final violin. Uh, and it has a little bit of a burl right here that I'm actually going to avoid and cut out, sadly. Um, yeah, I wish I could use it. It might be in there a little bit, but this is going to be where the carving takes place, and that is not the best for carving. But we'll see what we do. Uh, but we're going to be using this mountain ash for our neck, uh, which will be lovely, like I said. Uh, and then the fingerboard. The fingerboard is this piece of iron bark. Now, uh, a lot of these pieces of wood have unique kind of provenance to them. They have stories behind them. So it's not just a random board from someone's shop, um, but each of these pieces, we know which trees they came from, where in the community they came from, and a lot of the stories behind them. Um, that's in big part to Zach, uh, Marcel's son, and he has been scouting around finding these uh, pieces of wood from local lore and from local places, uh, and some from his, his personal collection. So this will end up being the fingerboard and the tailpiece. They'll match. Uh, we'll get to the back of the violin eventually. Uh, I have two options that I'm trying to decide between uh, of what I want to use in terms of the aesthetics of the instrument. And um, after I make that decision, we can discuss the back. Um, but the, that'll be in a little while. The top, however, is made from Sitka spruce. It's really funny. I had heard of Sitka spruce for a long time, never knowing it came from Sitka Alaska, right? That region. Uh, I actually spent time over in Japan and they used Sitka spruce for a lot of their carving stuff, for their puppetry and jazz. Um, it was amazing. And I got to work with some pieces over there and coming back to this, the States, in my region you can't find it. And so for them to, uh, for the folks in Sitka, Alaska to send this stuff, it's pretty awesome. Um, so anyways, that's where it gets named. Sitka spruce. Uh, it's from their region. And these are two by fours. Um, from a, an institution, a college that was up there years and years ago. Um, and they have a number of these that I'm going to be using to make the top. So I'm going to book match and split a few of these sets. These also, I'll zoom in here a little bit, have crazy growth rings. Um, I'll show you up close here so you can see this. It is so consistent and so solid. I don't know how big these trees were. They had to be huge. Um, but I'll show you up close. So I'm going to be using this really awesome Sitka spruce, uh, these two by fours, to make the top. There you go. Check that out. Those are all growth rings. So you can get it from the end grain. Super, super tight. You can see them up in this corner. But this is going to be lovely spruce to work with for a top. So like I said, I'm going to hand resaw these to make the top. Um, and I have a few of them, so we'll make sure we actually get that going here in a minute. But first, let's cut our rib structure. All right, so it's a little cold in the shop here this morning, waiting for things to warm up, and I want to take this opportunity to talk about safety and tool usage in my videos. Now, I use a lot of power tools. I use a lot of traditional hand tools. Um, I use some of these things, power tools and hand tools, in slightly abstract ways than a lot of other people use them, but I think that's the beauty of craftsmanship, is that you learn your own skill set and what you feel comfortable with and what's actually safe for you. Um, the two times I've been seriously injured uh, with angle grinders, it's because I was being safe by other people's standards. Now, I know that might be controversial and you can say, oh, whatever, but I'm telling you what I experienced and the truth to me. Um, so if you see me doing something that you think is unsafe or my finger is too close to a blade of some kind, I feel safe doing what I'm doing. Um, and so please respect the way that I use my tools. If you have comments about those things, I'm totally fine talking through them. That's great. Um, so I'm not shutting anybody down by sharing your opinion. Please do so. It's great. Uh, but just know that I feel safe in what I'm doing. It's not a lack of experience. I've been doing this for... 28 years, I don't know, I can't count. Uh, but uh, I, I'll, I'll let you see how I work. Just know that I take safety and the usage of my tools very seriously. It is my livelihood. Uh, and these are my livelihood and I value them very much. So I want to keep all of them. Um, in, in case in point, table saw. Uh, the table saw behind me, I have a saw stop 
that can tell the difference between my thumbs and a piece of wood. Um, and it, I don't have a blade guard on there. I do have a riving knife on there. That's mandatory for me. I would not use it without a riving knife uh, to keep the blade from pinching up against material or having a risk of kickback. Um, but the guard that comes on these tools oftentimes obscures the vision from what I'm cutting and the scale at which I'm cutting, I need to be able to see the blade and how close I am to things. So I take that off. So that is a safety feature um, that oftentimes is not safe in this scenario. If I'm cutting a large sheet of plywood, yeah, sure, blade guard can be on there. But in these small pieces and parts, it's better for me to see the blade and know where the danger is and know how to avoid it and respect it. So let's get cutting on jointing and, uh, and thinning out some stock for this violin. All right, for those who don't know what's happening here, I'm gonna give you a brief explanation of a jointer. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm actually preparing the wood to go onto other tools. So if I was gonna run this through a surface planer, like a power planer, you need one edge perfectly flat. That edge goes down, the planer then makes parallel passes to cut that material off the top. So any inconsistencies up here get cut off. If this piece is not dead flat, that machine will actually press it and bend it to where it is flat. So if you had a slight cup in your board and you ran it through, it can flatten it out, make the top and bottom parallel, and when it comes out, it bows back out. So now you have a thinner board, but you definitely don't have a flat board. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm making two parallel edges so that I can actually get the material that I need out of here for the C bouts or the sides. Now, I have now put one solid flat face on there so that's stable and I can safely run it through the table saw. I would not want to use this edge where it rocks and run it through a table saw because I'll get an inconsistent cut and it's dangerous, especially like one like this that rocks like a boat, okay? So I've got one flat face down here now because my jointer uses these reference planes and cuts the board flush on the bottom. Now, I'm gonna take this over the table saw and flush off one edge, make sure that it's dead flat. I can hand plane it or bring it back over the joiner to make sure that it's flat. Once I have those parallel sides, like this one that I've already done here, parallel side, nice smooth bottom, I'm then gonna cut the width that I need out and then the thin little pieces that will soon become the C-bouts of this violin. These little paddles you see are the best. They actually have a hook on the back to push the wood through safely. This crab apple is quite dense and has a beautiful color and grain. I think it's gonna make a great addition to the violin where it is in the sea bouts. But having never bent crab apple, let's see how this goes. So let's look at a few things I'm doing here. One is I'm always finding the correct orientation for stability as it goes through the blade. The blade is not excessively high in any way, just the gullets are clearing so that the majority of the dust collection goes down and into my dust collection system. It's always tempting to handle those little pieces of wood, but they are not safe to touch when they fall off the blade. Now, you will also notice my ring finger and my middle finger, on some cases, glide across the fence on the top rail. This keeps my hand from wandering and being too close to the blade. This is how I was professionally trained to use a table saw. And like I said, this may be controversial to some people, but for me, it's been the safest and the best way to address these pieces. Now, anything under this size, I obviously will be using a push stick, um, but I've had instances where push sticks are just not the safest for my hands in this case, just me personally. Here you'll see me using a push stick and a zero clearance piece of masonite that I run the table saw blade up through to keep proper clearance for these little pieces not to fall or get caught. It's very important for this portion to have a very, very flat back as you don't want those little pieces to taper. These little pieces will eventually be scraped and cleaned down to final size, but right now they're being cut to about 1.5, 1.7 millimeters thick. So what we've produced here are these little slats that are about a millimeter and a half thick and I'm going to have to plane them and scrape them down to their final dimension of one millimeter so they can be flexible. Okay, uh, But 
I have enough here in case a couple of the sides break. My favorite grain though is on this one that has the gray um, going through it, but I think that knot is going to prevent me from bending it very well. So it comes through, you can see this little knot right there. It actually starts to peek through on this side, so I'm getting to the spot where that's going to be a weak spot when I bend it, so I can't use that anymore. But I may try and come back and get a little something out of that for something special. So, I set my crab apple pieces aside. I'm going to use these now to fully dry out. And now, I can start bending the sea bouts out of these. But, let's cut the lower and upper bout ribs. We're going to let those cure and dry. And then, you'll see me scraping and sanding these down to their final dimension. I'm jointing an edge on this piece of yellow cedar to use as a reference face on the table saw. Now, this piece and the pieces of western cedar, specifically the western cedar, filled my whole shop with that wonderful hamster cage smelling aroma. And I'm being serious, I enjoyed it. But it's not the normal aromatic cedar. It has a little bit of a different flavor to it. Now here I'm actually slowly taking off a little bit of worm damage or bug damage to the outside of this board. Uh, it was just under the bark, and so I'm trying to get past the sapwood just barely because I really enjoyed the color at the edge of this board for the ribs. So I want to make sure I got just enough off and not enough of that color striping. I really can't wait to see how all these colors and grain patterns come together outside of my mind, but actually in the instrument. It's really exciting. So I cut my board small enough to go over my joints here without having to waste a lot of material. So this will be our ribs for our upper and lower bouts. I'm going to do this a couple times to get it. But I wanted to show you guys, when I run this over the machine, just to educate y'all, you have to be careful of the grain orientation on here. So if you look at this, you can see the structure of the grain right here. If I ran the tool this way, it would actually tear up the grain. If I run the tool the other way, I run the wood through the tool the other way, it'll lay down that grain and not tear out any. That's how I'm getting a nice smooth surface on there versus something that has tear out like this. So I can get this here. So you can see where the tool has gone the opposite way and hit the edge. That'll tear up the grain. So we're making sure we get this all nice and smooth so it'll be a good reference mark for our table saw as we cut our ribs, our sea bouts, or sorry, upper and lower bouts. So, all of our rib stuff. So let me do this a few more times and we'll get our slats all done. So here we are again back at the table saw to rip the thin rib stock. Now, in the next episode we'll start going through cutting the mold and some other pieces and parts as well as most likely bending these pieces that you see. But I also just want to take a moment to thank everybody that's watching and has participated in this so far including Marcel, Zach, Connie, and all the people up there in Sitka, Alaska.